Good afternoon, or nearly evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Emma Barnett, women's editor at The Telegraph, and I also present Women's Hour, so it is an absolute delight to be with someone, especially at your age, who's doing so much to change the face of politics. You don't really need an introduction, other than to say, we've seen that, we've waited since 1667 <laughs> to get some young blood into the Palace of Westminster. Uh, you do like you too. Love them. And a lot of people believe that you think Smirnoff Ice is the drink of gods. <sighs> it's overrated. It's overrated. overrated. Okay. <laughs> Apart from that, I want to ask, what is it like to stand across from your favourite man, other than Bono, Mr David Cameron, mm -hmm. every single week in the House of Commons? Um, well, to be honest, every time that we're in the chamber and David Cameron comes forward and puts something forward, it always just serves as a reminder why I'm there. Every single time. Because, that's helpful of him. You know, because everything that's being said, you know, whether it be policy or sometimes even the sense of humour, I just don't like it. Has he? No, I just... Has he told you to calm down, dear? No, no, I, I don't think anyone's brave enough to do that. <laughs> Well, let me get you all excited and I'll see what I can do. Okay. Now, let me... I want to understand, is being an MP how you thought it was going to be? No. <laughs> no, no. I, I had never had any intention of becoming a politician whatsoever. Um, I think I only decided to put my name forward to be a candidate in December. And here I am. <laughs> I like so, it. Uh, no, it, it was never an intention. It's, you know... The referendum changed Scotland and has also changed my life. So that's where it all came from. But I studied politics. I had no idea what I wanted to do, really, when I was 19, 20, 21. But here you are at 21, recently turned 21. Happy birthday. Um, and here you are in the House of Commons. I mean, you say that... I've read that you said that the referendum, the Scottish referendum, was a political awakening for yeah, you. Totally. But that moment where you decided to become a candidate, mm -hmm. talk to me about that. Well, the way it happened was, obviously we lost the referendum, wasn't the result that I would have liked. Um, but obviously there was this sudden momentum behind the SNP and there was the political awakening that had happened throughout the whole of Scotland didn't go away. People were suddenly really educated and political spin wasn't working anymore. And all of a sudden people were really questioning you know, representatives that they would have voted for in a heartbeat. So because of that, the, the local branch were urging me to go for it because there was nobody else who was able to do it. Uh, so eventually I was kind of guilt-tripped and I put my name forward. <laughs> guilt-tripped yeah. into putting forward. Okay. So. Now, on the night you won, which we saw a clip of there, yeah. a very historic moment, you beat a man who, you know, was the man to beat. And I read that your dad mm -hmm. knew from the beginning, quite early on in the vote, that yeah. you were going to win, but didn't tell you until mm -hmm. the very last minute. Yeah. Why? <laughs> well, no, because what had happened was I was told kind of to stay away from the count for a good while because it would be a media frenzy and things. So I just stayed in the house and I think I watched The Big Bang Theory or something. I, I thought, I'm not watching politics. And uh, so I, I get the phone call. And my dad's right, we're coming along to get you. How's it looking? And he says, oh, it's close. And I was like, all right, okay. Get yourself geared up. So I arrived. And it, it was the same thing. It was really, really close. You know, don't don't get ahead of yourself. Went behind the curtain. Was like, You're rehearsing oh. your loser's speech at this uh, point. He, he says, uh, "I just wanted to keep you calm, so you didn't get over, you know, excited. So, but I, you've won. <laughs> <laughs> I, you've won. Okay, that's the way. A man, a dad, a good dad, keeping Aye, your feet on the man. ground there. Good man. Um, in terms of that moment though, when you realised you became an MP, mm -hmm. it must have been daunting. Well. Becoming the MP actually wasn't particularly daunting because everything I said throughout that campaign and everything I've said since being elected, I really believe. So, I mean, it was like during the campaign, folk were asking me, you know, do you not feel intimidated? Do you not feel quite nervous? And I think with some of the policies that are being put upon the poorest in our society just now, I'm not the one who should be nervous. So when I'm going down there, I know exactly what I'm arguing for. So the nerves dissipate when you understand and you believe in what you're talking about. So that wasn't daunting. Now, the speech that you gave, mm -hmm. obviously contained your maiden speech that yeah. has been viewed more than 10 million times, contained a lot of your passion, a lot mm -hmm. of your ideals. 
But if you, it's very different to be able to criticize mm -hmm. and then actually go and do. Mm -hmm. So if you were given power tomorrow, mm -hmm. and if you'd got your dream and Scotland became independent, mm -hmm. what would be the first policy that you would actually implement and how? Well, it would depend what government Scotland voted in. I mean, I mean the, re the reason why I want independence is because I think that Scotland should have power in its own hands so that we hold an election where Scotland gets exactly what it votes for because we've been in a ridiculous situation whereby the entirety of Scotland can vote Labour and yet we've had perpetual Conservative governments, you know. So I, I think when we're independent, I would be looking to try and build a more socially just society, a more equal society, it's always... But how? Driven you said you, uh, I've, uh, we've seen that speech, it was very impressive. What you're saying, and equally what Nicola Sturgeon was saying on this stage earlier, everyone's applauding. Mm -hmm. They're really crowd-pleasing ideals. Uh -huh. But I, I would just love to know how you would do some of this. I think things. it's to do with making sure that people have opportunities. See concrete things like free tuition that has been introduced. Concrete policies like that makes such a difference. I mean, it, we've even heard it all today. When you educate people, you empower them. So making sure that we've got policies like free education, we can continue that. Making sure that it's the poorest and most vulnerable that aren't suffering, whether that be introducing X amount of taxes or whatever. Looking X at amount map, of taxes or whatever, though, uh -huh. is quite important. I no, mean, in, I, the, totally in, the, in I, the sense of, do you have any sympathy whatsoever for the government's position with the deficit that we face? Not the manner in which they're dealing with it, no. I think the thing about austerity is not only is it morally wrong, it's completely wrong, but it also doesn't work. Austerity is punishing the most vulnerable people in society. Meanwhile, it's the politicians and the bankers that have made the problems, and yet they've seemed to have benefited the most. I just received a wage rise there. I think it was 11%. <laughs> Why? When ordinary folk aren't getting that. So austerity has got all priorities wrong. What should be happening is more money should be getting invested into ordinary people because when people have got money in their pockets, they spend it. And when people Where spend is that money, money going to come from, though? Well, I, I mean, there's a, a whole load of things. It's a case of following the money trail. Why is it that bankers are getting paid more in bonuses now than they were before the crash? But the money's there. It's about making sure that people can get it, whether it be through introducing a living wage, making sure that people actually have a decent wage with money in their pockets. The uh, cuts to tax credits, that's appalling. And it's actually going to hit women the hardest. Things like that are, are horrendous. And it's all being justified through, oh, we all need to tighten our belts. Why is it that it's ordinary people that have to tighten their belts, and yet my belt's not being tightened? Well, you sound quite like Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised to read in an open letter this week mm -hmm. that you think Jeremy Corbyn isn't really the man to do it for Labour or the man to get you guys, the SNP, mm -hmm. linked up with Labour. Why is that? No, no, I th the SNP's always said that if there are particular issues that we agree with Jeremy Corbyn on, or the Labour Party on, we'll be happy to work with him. In fact, the SNP are quite excited about, for instance, Trident. We would look forward to working on that. But I think... But you say the election of Jeremy Corbyn uh, changes nothing. Mm -hmm. Quote, it stirs misleading nostalgia and sentimentality for romanticism attached to Labour as the party of social justice. Yes. Because I think... If That's quite look, damning. If you look at Labour's record over the last 10 years, I'm talking the sort of Blairite years, but in particular even the last uh, government there, they have not been an effective opposition to the Tories. I have sat in that chamber and watched Labour members sit on the benches and not vote against the cuts. That, how can you claim to be the party of social justice when you're prepared to so do that? you don't think Corbyn can take his well, party that's, with it? that's where I think Corbyn is in a very difficult position. Because, I mean, I agree with Jeremy on an awful lot of things, but he's in a position whereby the majority, or a hell of a lot, of his own parliamentarians don't agree with him. But what about the country? Uh, I know you talk specifically about Scotland, but just to look across the UK while you're still a member of it. Yes. <laughs> there isn't an appetite, it seems, from voting patterns mm -hmm. for a lurch to the left. Mm -hmm. And Ed Miliband was pretty left wing. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn's even more left wing. Yeah. So don't you care about getting into power or at least getting into bed with someone who's got a shot at power? Well, it depends what he's going to do with that power. But do you think he's electable? That's what I'm trying to well, say. Or, or totally. I think if you look at the, the, you know, 
the momentum that was built behind his campaign it actually reminded me an awful lot of the Yes campaign. It was about hope. But that's again where, unfortunately, I'm, I've been quite disappointed with Jeremy Corbyn in that, for instance, the Trident debate didn't happen. Then there was no women in any major positions. Then he, there was an unelected lord in the, the cabinet. I thought, where, where's that firebrand that people were so liking? more to do for Jeremy Corbyn. And as you mentioned, there are not that many women elected into the mm -hmm. powerful positions. He's also a 66-year-old bloke. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, from your position, we've heard from Theresa May today on this stage. We've also heard from Nicola Sturgeon. What do you think are the barriers remaining for women in this country today, not in politics for a moment? I think a lot of it is stems from financial problems. I mean, the, the thing I mentioned there, tax credits in particular, are going to disproportionately affect women incredibly. And when you find that you've got no money in your pockets, it's harder. You know, you've, I mean, I know people personally. One mother I know is working three jobs just now and barely sees her children, so she's got to, and she's scraping to pay the bills, you know, so I, I think... So the economic side the, of The economic side of things, but I also think there is still subtle sexism existing. I, I suffer it myself quite but often. Let's my talk about... Work. Yes. <laughs> I mean, could you give us the worst example of sexism you've had since you've been in the House of Commons? I mean, well, there's a couple of things. One thing that really irritates me is actually journalists, whereby Sorry. They, there is a huge <laughs> amount of journalists who ask me about the clothes I wear, where I buy it, what style it's from, how much. Do you that? Still, still, still. And I think you would never ask a guy that of what relevance is it what I'm wearing, of what relevance is it where I bought it. Are you not more interested in? you know, talking politics. I should you know? say, Mary refused to have makeup before we came on, but I gleefully seized upon having some makeup. If my mother can't make me wear it, nobody backstage <laughs> is going to make me wear it. <laughs> but seriously, mm -hmm. in, in, so, so, so there's the, the journalist side of it, but what yeah. about you? We, well, we've read a lot about the yeah. House of Commons. There's been some very serious things. Uh, the the um, alleged abuse with the abuse scandal of Lord Renard, which people will remember, to, which plagued the Liberal Democrats during the last government. You know, what is it like being a 21-year-old woman mm. in the House of Commons? Well, see, I, I'm kind of disadvantaged in three ways. And that one, I'm SNP, so a lot of people aren't really keen on us down there. Second of all, I'm a woman, so there's the natural subtle sexism that I'm sure all women have experienced. And thirdly, I'm young. <laughs> So I've got my fair share of, you know, patronising comments. Well, let's talk about that, because we had a yeah. chat about that off stage, didn't yeah. we? Reverse ageism. We often hear about ageism against older women. Yeah. Do you in any way feel that you have to make up for the lack of years you've had on this planet yet? And if so, how? No, because I think... Good. The thing about... I mean, I said it throughout the election was... A parliament should represent your society, and in order for it to represent society, it should reflect the people in that society. It should be made up of people of different classes, different ages, different genders, different religions, different sexualities. Otherwise, how are you going to get a real varied debate that you can have? Otherwise, it becomes a stale, middle-class, middle-income boys' club. And that is what Westminster is effectively. It's still got that boys club attitude about it. And I experience it not just when you're in the chamber, but you experience it in your one-to-one -one conversations. You know, the first couple of weeks, I was, uh, a couple of people were calling me honey and sweetheart, to which I would always call them darling. You know, so <laughs> you, you get things like that. You know, it's, it's alive and well within Westminster. But you, are any of your constituents concerned about the fact that you're 21? No, it's genuinely not been an issue because when we were chapping doors throughout the campaign, journalists that were out with me would, would be asking exactly that question. And I understand why they're asking it. But what has happened in Scotland is people are so switched on that political spin and aesthetic things like gender or your age or anything, they don't matter. That's not what it's about. What policy are you putting forward? What do you believe in? Are you capable? Are you going to stick up for me? Do you understand the issues affecting my life? And if the answer to them is yes, then you know, people are quite happy. Uh, they were happy <laughs> since I got elected. Oh, so. Of course. <laughs> and in, in terms of yourself now, because you're being held up as a role model, mm -hmm. 
earlier today, Theresa May says she doesn't have role models, as she was resisting from Tina Brown the idea that mm. she was the next Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Do you have a role model? I don't know. I've got role models in all aspects of my life. I mean, politically, the one I've always said is Margot MacDonald. I think she was a phenomenal politician and woman. But even personally, the, the women that have been in my life, I, I think of my grandparents and my mum's mum especially, were incredibly strong women that I have no idea how they got through some of the things they did. And even my mum always brought us up to, you know, be intelligent, do the best you can, and don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. And would you describe yourself as a feminist? Oh, I totally. I. No, it's, it, no, it's, it's, it's one of those. Good. I'm actually surprised that I, I always think, how can you not be a feminist? Well, you know, I think it, the same, but it's, interestingly, lots of people yeah. say, I'm all for women's rights, but. Oh, no, no, I'm a feminist. And something I was also interested to read. You know, there are 191 women mm -hmm. now in the House of Commons. There are 32 LGBT mm -hmm. MPs. And I read that you, you said to people, when, you, when you've been asked about your decision to come out as gay, you replied, I was never in. Yeah. Which I love. Yeah. It's a great line. <laughs> it's true. Great line. <laughs> um, is it important that you now represent and speak out as well as for your constituents, but for the wider LGBT community? Have you found yourself in that role? It's, I don't see it as a role. I see it as an issue that everybody should be talking about because LGBT rights are the same as women's rights and the same as any rights. They're human rights. It's about equality. It but obviously, we've had I, to have certain fights uh -huh. like getting equal marriage yeah. through... You know, there has been... There are still issues to go uh -huh. that are quite oh, specific. Oh, totally, yeah. No, I, I think that... I would find it very hypocritical if I was to sit here and say I shouldn't be talking about them because when I am reaping the benefits of people before me who have done, who have argued for equal rights in much more difficult circumstances. So, yeah, entirely it's... Okay, and in terms of the future... Yeah. Babies of the House, as they're known, yeah. the late Charles Kennedy. There's a, there's a good line of people who've gone on to have amazing political careers. Mm. Um, do you see yourself being a politician for life? No. Well, it, I think it, the reason I became involved in politics was I felt there was a need for it. And I felt if there's something that I'm rallying around that needs to be said and I'm capable of saying it, then there's an air of responsibility to go and do it. So I think you should only be in politics so long as it's necessary. If you go in thinking, I want a career, then you're the wrong person. In fact, that's been the problem in politics. It shouldn't be about where am I going to be in 10 years' time? Am I going to be as well accomplished as Charles Kennedy was at X age? It shouldn't be that. It should be, right, what am I dealing with this week? So what do you make of the fact that just 24 hours ago, Nicola yeah. Sturgeon, who I did see they had a selfie together backstage just before. Her idea. <laughs> Her idea. <laughs> she likes selfies, doesn't she? Uh, aye, she's good at them. <laughs> Does she like Shimon off ice? I don't know, I don't know. It's tap water all round. Come on, you must have got drunk with Nicola. Anyway, she said 24 hours ago she could see you as the future leader of the SNP. Mm -hmm. I I'm a bit preoccupied just now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, of course, it's an a incredibly flattering thing that's it's been, it's been said to me multiple times, but no, there's... Oh, sorry, it's not just by Nicola. No, okay. no, no, it's a lot of... God, my auntie's even saying it to me. But, uh, no, it's, of course, it is a, a flattering thing, but no, it's, it's not about that. It shouldn't be about having your eye on something. All I'm interested in is doing what I said I would do during that campaign, and that's as far as my priorities go. I might not want to be the leader. <laughs> No, so, true. But, oh. And what do your friends... I've just got to finish with this yeah. before we get booted off the stage. What do your friends make of what you're doing? Because they're 21 as well. Yeah. Some of them, I imagine, have also just graduated with mm. you. I still can't believe you managed to get a first in politics <laughs> whilst being an MP and doing your revision in the House of Commons Library. Yeah. Um, what do they make of all of this? I do think it's a bit mad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> No, they, they are incredibly proud and excited by it. And I have to say, it's actually not me that excites them. It's just politics right now that excites them. It just so happens that their pal's involved in it. Um, they'd never tell me they were proud, but I know they are. I've had the odd pint bought for me.
Have you had them down to London to go partying in the Commons bar yet? Are they, they, not they can afford to come down to London. <laughs> Gosh, I'm on. Well, I should say, Murray Black is going home in a minute on a flight yeah. and she still lives with her mum and dad, so she's keeping it totally real when she's not in Westminster. Yeah. And they're going to tell you off if you drink too many Schmernoff ices, right? I'm not that young. <laughs> oh, dad, I'm a... I've not got a bedtime. Yeah. To be fair, we did have a joke about the fact that these microphones made us feel like we were going to do a Britney or Beyonce concert. Mm -hmm. And we got excited, but that's not going to happen. What is going to happen is we're going to put our hands together for the UK's youngest MP, Mary Black. Thank you.